So I, I, first, I want to start out by thanking Alan for bringing us together here to talk about genome stability and instability, whatever, whatever emphasis you want to make. And so um, in my lab, we are interested in the uh, mechanisms that at the time of the life cycle where the most instability is introduced during meiosis in the germline, that what mechanisms there are that ensure that there is as little of the large-scale translocations that are, have been part of Bernard Dujon's uh, emphasis, uh, that very little of that happens. Now, the, the central event of meiosis is, of course, that uh, homologous chromosomes are separated from each other uh, during the first meiotic division, and this achieves the hybridization of the genome. This hybridization critically depends on the separation of uh, homologous chromosomes, and that is dependent on crossing overs to occur between homologs that ensure that they are attaching to different um, opposite spindles and are separated. So crossing overs mediate uh, the segregation of chromosomes during meiosis. These crossing overs are introduced by the, the formation of a remarkable, remarkably high number of double-stranded breaks that are enzymatically introduced by a, a transesterase called SPO11 in a large number of places, and only a subset of those are processed then into crossovers. So the, the, the long-term consequence of crossing over is that there is a new, that there are new uh, combinations of allele generated, but the short-term consequences that it is required for disjunction during meiosis one. Now, uh, there are really three critical events that are contributing the, to the uh, exchange during meiosis. One is homolog pairing, oops, and homolog pairing occurs by a surprising and paradoxical mechanism where initially centromeres are non-homologously paired and then homologous chromosomes are brought together. Uh, the, the next event is homologous recombination where, as I said, double strand breaks are processed into crossovers and this homologous recombination takes place in the context of an elaborate structure called the synaptonymal complex uh, which uh, juxtaposes homologous chromosomes in, in, the, in our model organism. Uh, budding yeast is made up of a transverse filament protein, ZIP1, as well as a uh, E3 ligase homolog, ZIP3, which localizes to future crossover sites. Now, this, the story that I want to share with you today is an unpublished story uh, that uh, uh, shows that uh, the 26 proteasome controls all these three events, so I will try to convince you here uh, in, in, in what way the proteasome is involved in these steps. Uh, this, this work is almost entirely the work of one very uh, uh, talented graduate student called Jaswinder Ahuja, who is now in the Lichten lab and the NCI, as well as two undergrads in the lab, Hannah Morris and Vincent Matthews, who've contributed to this and we've benefited from uh, these collaborators and uh, the funding mentioned here. Now, like a lot of work in yeast, this started out with a uh, screen. So uh, uh, several years ago, we had noticed that many of the deletion mutants that are genes and code for genes that are important for uh, meiosis uh, have a, a strange, uh, uh, surprising uh, property that they are meiotically temperature sensitive for meiotic progression. And this includes a deletion of the ZIP1 gene that I had told you before. So, a ZIP1 mutant will progress through meiosis um, efficiently at low temperature, while at high temperature it will undergo a complete meiotic arrest. We screened for additional uh, deletion mutants that have a similar feature and stumbled across a gene called PRE9, which encodes an alpha subunit of the proteasome, which has exactly the same features as a, 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 the ZIP1 deletion. When we're looking at the 
uh, mitotic features of a benign mutant, there is uh, no difference between the two temperatures. So this is a true meiosis-specific phenotype. So to the, uh, this pre-9 then encodes for the alpha-3 subunit of the core proteasome. <laughs> and to, to, to remind you about the structure of the proteasome, it is made up of uh, 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 two rings, seven, seven protein ring systems, uh, which are the beta proteins, which uh, are the center of the, where proteolysis happens. And then there are, are this is uh, sandwiched between two alpha rings, uh, which, which have uh, accessory functions. The core proteasome itself is sandwiched again between two regulatory components that are involved in the recognition of the polyubiquitin chain as well as unfolding of the substrate and uh, access of the substrate to the uh, core. Now, the alpha-3 component is the only of the proteasome components that is actually non-essential and uh, work from the Hochstrasse lab has shown that it is non-essential because it, in, a, in the mitotic cell, can be replaced by the alpha-4 component. Now, the, the first question that we wanted to know, which is a very classical way of, uh, in, in the meiosis field is, is we wanted to know, is alpha-3 required for all meiotic events or only for some of them? And uh, what we can do here is one can eliminate the, uh, the component that makes double-stranded breaks. And so normally, uh, defects in recombination or the synaptonomal complex trigger a cell cycle arrest that then uh, <laughs> results in prophase, meio prophase of meiosis 1 arrest. So if one uh, eliminates the initiation of recombination, then the, the, the arrest goes away because there's, there's no defect that, can, that, is that is detectable by the checkpoints. So when we did this experiment in an, the alpha-3 uh, proteasome mutant and took away double-strand breaks, we surprisingly found that, uh, the, that in the absence of uh, double strand breaks, the complete proteasome is not required anymore, and uh, one needs, uh, by implication, one needs uh, the complete proteasome only if double strand breaks are formed. So, for an event that is double strand break formation uh, related event. So, with, with this in mind, we then became curious what part of meiosis as, is this special type of proteasome actually important for? And so we asked the first question, is it important for the pairing of homologous chromosomes? Now, um, the pairing of homologous chromosomes uh, proceeds in a rather uh, counterintuitive manner, where there's ample evidence from the Kleckner lab and more more recently from the Camerino Terror Lab in, in budding yeast and mouse, that sequences along chromosomes arms are uh, along chromosome arms are paired in an allelic manner. But at the same time, there's also evidence that centromeres prior to the formation of double-stranded breaks uh, uh, form um, homology independent pairs at the centromeres. And so this, is, this has been shown uh, in budding geese uh, from the Röder lab and, uh, and, and also for uh, wheat in the Moore lab. And so only when double strand breaks have been formed, then this, the homologous pairing occurs between chromosomes along their entire length. Now, to, to investigate the question whether homologous pairing at centromeres might be affected by uh, the, the proteasome, we use this uh, experimental technique that had been established previously. And so one can monitor the number of kinetochore signals to, uh, to, to see whether there's pairing either homologously, as in a situation where double strand breaks occur, or non-homologously, where double strand, double strand breaks are, uh, have not occurred. And so in both cases, we would expect 16 uh, 
uh, kinetic or signals, whereas when the, the ZIP1 protein is missing, then the, even the non-homologous or homology-independent pairing at centromeres is abolished. So when we did these experiments in the alpha-3 mutant, we encountered the number of kinetochore signals. We found that uh, centromeres are definitely paired at a very similar to wild-type levels in the alpha-3 mutant. And so to, to find out whether they are homologously paired, we uh, made use of a, a, a centromeric marker at one particular chromosome. And what we found there is that while in the wild type, the centromeres are, are uh, to, to a very high degree homologously paired, in the absence of the alpha-3 component, there's a lot of cells where uh, centromeres are paired, but in a non-homologous fashion. And so, so, so this indicated that uh, the, uh, a complete proteasome is required for the release of non-homologous centromere associations. And I will show you in a moment that this is not due to a defect in double strand break formation. So we, we then were wanted to know whether the proteasome is needed for repair between homologous chromosome arms. And we've, we found here that there are very distinct defects at uh, two steps. One, for, uh, the proteasome plays a role in the efficient uh, double strand break formation. And secondly, it is required for one pathway uh, in, the, in, in the repair of these double stranded breaks. Now, um, uh, this is a simplified version of what the recombination pathways that Jim Haber had shown you already. And so this is just showing you that there are two outcomes of meiotic double strand break processing. One, crossovers, which is the, the stuff that is important for segregation of homologous chromosomes, and the other one that results in non-crossovers. Now, importantly, these resected double strand breaks, as well as the single end invasions and double holiday junctions that are specifically resolved into crossovers can be monitored and detected by physical analysis at uh, a particular recombination hotspot in budding yeast. And so when we use this, uh, when we monitored the formation of double strand breaks uh, in, the, in both in a alpha-3 mutant and also in a, in a situation where we chemically inhibited the activity of the proteasome, we found that under both conditions, there is a very similar reduction of double strand breaks to about 60 to 70 percent of, of double strand breaks in a, when measured in a, in a background that accumulates double strand breaks. When we then looked at the fate of these double strand breaks uh, in the processing, we found that uh, non-crossovers, both in the, alpha, uh, in the absence of the alpha-3 component and when the proteasome is chemically inhibited, are formed essentially normally, whereas crossovers are dramatically reduced under both conditions and very similarly. This suggested to us that the proteasome is not just a general factor for double strand break repair, but it is specifically required for one of the two pathways that, that is uh, Im important in uh, meiotic double strand breaks resulting in crossovers. Okay, so um, for the aficionados here of double strand break repair, we, we also uh, investigated uh, uh, the, the particular step at which uh, the crossover formation uh, goes wrong. And just to summarize the data here, we found that uh, all crossover specific strand invasion events, the single end invasion and the interhomolog double holiday junctions appear with a dramatic delay indicating that the proteasome is required for this early strand invasion event that results in crossing over. Okay, so to summarize this, this first part of the talk, we, we have shown that um, in this situation where the proteasome is required also for uh, uh, the release of non-homologous centromere pairs, non-crossovers can form normally in the absence of the proteasome, but it's required for the, for the crossing over as well as for the release of non-homologous centromere pairs. 
Now, the, 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 the second defining or the, the third defining process of meiotic recombination is the formation of the synaptonomal complex. And um, when we looked in the uh, alpha 3 mutant as well as chemically inhibited proteasome, uh, in, when the proteasome was chemically inhibited, we see uh, very little of these uh, 16 synaptonomal complexes that form normally between, between homologous chromosome pairs. Uh, at the same time, there is uh, uh, normal numbers of CYP3 foci uh, recruited along chromosome arms, indicating that the proteasome very specifically is required for the uh, polymerization of CYP1, but not of the, for the localization of this uh, crossover marker. We, we wanted to know in what way the polymerization of the synaptonomal complex goes wrong. And so for that purpose, we used a centromere marker that, uh, that tells us where the centromere, uh, centromeres are. Now, in a, in a wild type situation, early on, uh, ZIP1 localizes to these non-homologous centromere pairs. And then when one looks at cells with similar morphologies at a late time point, uh, ZIP1 has moved uh, away from those to a large degree. By contrast, in the absence of the functional proteasome, ZIP1 stays associated with the centromeres, indicating that the proteasome activity is required for uh, ZIP1 to polymerase away and, and translocate to chromosome arms. So th th this indicated a post double strand break function in the CYP1 localization of the proteasome. And so, so we were also interested whether there's a pre double strand break uh, function of the proteasome in CYP1 localization. And so to, to find out about that, we introduced the invisible alpha 3 mutation here into a background that, are, that does normally not form double strand breaks. And surprisingly, we discovered that, there, that uh, the proteasome has a, an effect on the uh, localization of the zip one synaptonomal complex protein, even in that situation, where normally there is uh, the, the bulk of the one localizes away from chromosomes into polycomplexes, whereas in the proteasome mutant, there is abundant localization of zip one in this punctured manner that we call Milky Way. Uh, along with chromatin, indicating that a proteasome is required for removing the central element protein from chromatin even before double strand break formation. So, we are now interested in well, how does the proteasome do this job? And so, the, the, the next few slides um, I hope will uh, convince you that the proteasome may actually be doing this by localizing directly to meiotic chromosomes and getting recruited to meiotic chromosomes. So for this purpose, um, uh, we use a, um, a, 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 a GFP tag component of the core proteasome uh, that, that we actually got from Phil Heater's lab and, uh, and looked over time at the association of this uh, proteasome component with meiotic chromatin, and we found that there's a, there's a, um, a, a, a base occupancy early on of about 10 particles, but then there is two waves of recruitment during which uh, um, proteasome particles are massively recruited to meiotic chromatin. We wanted to know whether this is just affects the 20S proteasome or also uh, the, the 19S regulatory component. And we see uh, not identical recruitment patterns, but very similar recruitment patterns also for the regulatory component of the proteasome. So this indicates that it, in a meiosis specific manner, proteasome is recruited to chromatin. We, we then wanted to know, well, what's, what are the factors that are important for this recruitment? And so we, we concentrated on um, two meiosis-specific genes that I have told you about already, ZIP3 and ZIP1, 
and in the deletion mutants of those, the recruitment, the, the, the additional recruitment that one sees in the wild type is essentially completely eliminated. So these, both of these components also localized to centromeres. And so we think that these cent centromere, meiosis specific centromeric components of the proteasome are actually essential, uh, of th these, these meiosis specific components of chromosomes are actually essential for recruiting the proteasome to meiotic chromosomes. We also asked whether this is uh, double strand break dependent, and it is. Uh, partially double strand break dependent as indicated by the analysis of a SPO11 mutant here. Uh, so consistent with the fact that ZIP3 is important for the recruitment and it does so by its centromeric uh, localization, we found that uh, in, at an early time point when we see a wide spread of uh, uh, the number of proteasome particles recruited to chromosomes, those uh, cells that have few ZIP3 foci uh, have not re also not recruited a lot of uh, proteasome, whereas those that have ZIP3 sitting at the uh, at centromeres uh, have recruited m far more proteasome components. Now, we, we wanted to know whether this is uh, uh, evolutionary conserved, and this is I hope this is visible, uh, but uh, so uh, using mouse spread chromosomes that we got from um, Pat Hunt's lab, we, we, we localized the, the chromosome axis with this red antibody and the green antibody, thank you, this, uh, and the green antibody is directed at, against the proteasome common, and so we, we, we show that at the um, equivalent pactin stage during mouse meiosis, there's also a proteasome uh, recruited to myotic chromosomes. This will uh, not, surprise, not be that surprising for one person in the audience at least, because Phil Heater in a beautiful uh, PLOS genetics paper a couple of years ago demonstrated that um, a, a component of the 19S proteasome is re, uh, recruited to DNA damage also in vegetative cells, uh, uh, in, in, in mitotic cells. Okay, so to summarize what I've told you today, the proteasome, and this is the core proteasome and the regulatory proteasome particles, are recruited by mouse specific centromeric components. And what we think it's doing there is destabilizing these, these non homologous centromeric interactions. It also, the proteasome also controls specific steps in, uh, uh, in, in DNA. Uh, uh, dynamics, so this is double strand break formation, crossovers, and the ensuing synapses, but not non crossovers and uh, recruitment of one particular protein. That raises the question well, why do cells go through the trouble of forming these non homologous centromere interactions just to take them apart in a very regulated manner? And so, what we think is happening here is that there are, that there is a tendency of uh, homologous DNA sequences along the entire genome to undergo interactions. And that raises the danger that there are ectopic interactions that, that would, during meiosis, result in massive occurrence of translocations. And so, to, uh, so we propose that this is a, a, a safeguarding mechanism that there have to be as a a, a minimum number of allelic interactions for homologous chromosomes actually to undergo uh, homologous and allelic pairing. And the counterforce that tethers this, uh, prevents these interactions to prematurely be stabilized occurs via non-homologous centromere interactions. Now these non-homologous centromere interactions would have to be sufficiently unstable to, res to be able to respond to this kind of uh, allelic interactions. And so we think that, this, that the proteasome is actually destabilizing these interactions. And this is, then I'll be happy to uh, answer questions.
But at the alpha three subunit, is, is it necessary for the complex solution? Is the alpha three um, component uh, necessary for the recruitment of the proteas? We, we have we we've not analyzed that experiment yet. It's okay. a good question. Is there a genetic phenotype of the alpha three? Perfect. You think of that as alpha three? Yeah. So what was the phenotype? The phenotype is just that my, so there's mitotically there's no phenotype. So in terms of vegetative growth, there's no phenotype. In, in meiotically, they, the deletion mutants arrest in a temperature sensitive okay. manner and do do all this stuff that I've told you. Yeah, yeah, Jim. So <coughs> when you say it's displacing zip from these non-bodies, mm -hmm. is, is it displacing or is it degrading? Uh, uh, could, so, so the question is, is, is the chromosome degrading ZIP1 or is it displacing the, uh, ZIP1? Um, uh, the, 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 the answer is we don't know the answer. The, I would suspect that it's displacing it and it potentially degrading something else that, that um, allows ZIP1 to localize to other positions. That's my guess. But we have to do that experiment, absolutely. In the interest of time, I think we have to move on. Okay.